So thank you very much to be here. Everybody's here. You are 350 people from 43, 44 countries who have been registered for this webinar. So thank you very much. Uh, we are talking about uh, NERF compression of the open land and uh, it was uh, sold out in two days. So thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Donc, Shun, Shukran, Grazie mille, Aligato Gozaimas, Tien Tien, Tak Tak. Et merci beaucoup to be here. The main purpose of this training is to explain how to examine the uh, nerves of uh, the uh, upper limbs. So there is the uh, Dr. Elizabeth Haggert, who practices in Stockholm at the Sophia Ahmed Hospital. She is one of the world's greatest specialists in the field of uh, nervous pathologies. Her clinical examination is codified sensitivity and uh, strength uh, examination, compression, tiny sign, and uh, squash collapse test. She rarely prescribes additional examinations, so this is very interesting to listen to her. And uh, thank you, Elizabeth, to show us your standard physical examination for nerve entrapment. Thank you for uh, having me, Thomas. <laughs> Second guy is uh, Jean-Paul Brutus. He works in Montreal, Canada at the Centre Exception MD. He has an immense experience in carpal tunnel syndrome and knows everything about diagnostic pitfalls. He will talk about his uh, examination and strategy in failed uh, CTS surgery. Thank you, Jean-Paul, to be here. Thank you very much. Bonjour, hello, buenos dias. And uh, may I introduce myself? I am a hand surgeon in Versailles, France. I've been practicing in Trasson for many years, and I fully integrated this imaging exam in the consultation room to complement the clinical examination of the nerves. I will show you how to examine nerves with a Neutrasan machine. Uh, of course, you can ask questions in the chat box, so don't hesitate to put some uh, hello or some questions. But at the end, we will have 15 minutes uh, dedicated to discuss uh, all together about this uh, uh, subject. Thank you very much to be here and uh, thank you, Elizabeth, to uh, start this webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm so happy to be here today. I have someone else sharing a screen at the moment, but I will see if I can share mine at the same time. Uh, Go ahead, Elizabeth. There we go. Can everyone see the screen now? Yes, uh, excellent. So my talk today is about the standardized physical examination for nerve entrapments in the upper extremity. And this is the stuff that I use every single day in my clinic. And I use it at least 10 times a day. So if I have a patient that walks in that I think has a carpal tunnel syndrome, I won't assume that it is a carpal tunnel syndrome. I will start by examining the entire upper extremity, and I will tell you how I do this. But the question is, why should you even bother with a standardized exam of nerves in the upper extremity? The answer is quite simple. It is diagnosis. Well, we are all doctors or physiotherapists, or occupational therapists here today. Diagnosis should be the most simple thing of all to discuss, but diagnosis is so important that there are even tons of books coming out about diagnosis. These are books written by a lady by the name of Lisa Sanders. She's a doctor in, in uh, New York. She's written tons of columns for the New York Times. One of her books is so popular that it's become a Netflix series, and I'm sure quite a few of you have seen this. I love what the title of one of her books, Every Patient Tells a Story, and I think that is just the way it is. Every single time I have a patient that walks into my clinic, that patient has a story to tell. Well, this is what Lisa tell, says in her video about diagnosis. The audio, unfortunately, in this video is not very high, but there are subtitles that you can read. Thank you. 
And I just love this little video clip because it just says, getting the diagnosis right is the most important thing you can do for your patient. If you don't get the diagnosis right, you will never get the treatment right. And this is where it all starts. Every single connection that we have with the patient is about getting the diagnosis right so everything else is right. So when we look at the diagnosis for upper extremity nerve compressions, we boil it down to three steps. We use a muscle testing protocol, we use the scratch collapse test, and then we use pain and or Tinel's test. Let's start by looking at the background. How did we come up with this sort of muscle testing? Well, when we look at the muscle test, or when we look at an acute nerve compression, all of us know that if you have an acute nerve compression, or you have complete axonal myelin disruption, you have what's called axonotomesis. Axonotomesis is, for instance, what you see in a Saturday night palsy when you have a patient coming in with a hand drooping. This is a complete loss of axonal and myelin function. This is when you have sensory and or motor functional loss. It will recover by itself a millimeter per day. But if you look at a chronic nerve compression, it's something that is entirely different. In a chronic nerve compression, you will usually not have axonal injuries until you have a nerve that has been severely compressed. Rather, you will have alterations in epineural blood flow and in the saltatory conduction, and you will have a Schwann cell proliferation. Seddon's grading of muscle strength is by far nothing new. This has been around since 1954, and I'm sure that we all know about Seddon's grading of muscle strength, where grade zero is a complete paralysis of an upper limb, for instance, Grade zero to three symbolizes an axonal injury, whereas a grade five is a normal nerve. But what happens to the grade four? The grade four is a contraction against gravity and slight resistance. This is what happens in nerve entrapments in the upper extremity. This is what we like to call the hidden paresis. It is hidden because it's not going to be apparent when your patient walks in. You're not going to see atrophies. You're not going to see a limb hanging. This is a paresis that you have to go and look for. So the question is, how do we look for it? Well, in chronic nerve compressions, when it comes to neurophysiological studies, EMG studies, etc., these may reveal possible axonal damage to the nerve. But these will quite often, unfortunately, be normal in early nerve entrapments. This little figure that you see on your left is one of the most beautiful ones that I've seen in a long time. And this is by Lee Dellen in 1992. And Lee Dellen wrote this. This multi-channel oscilloscope face tyrant conceals his empire building beneath a white lab coat. With hammer stethoscopes as reminders of medicine's historic past before the days of computer averaging evoked potentials and FNH waves. Remember, have sufficient confidence in your clinical skills that your judgment as a doctor, not doctor electrophysiologist printout report, will be the final authority. I think it's beautiful, don't you guys? So instead of having an axonal injury, but we have changes in axonal transport, it means that the specificity when it comes to nerve conduction studies is going to be very low appropriately between 30 to 70 percent. On the other hand, if you look at a manual muscle testing algorithm, in a blinded control study, this has been shown to have a sensitivity and a specificity between 88 and 93 percent, and the scratch collapse test between 89 percent sensitivity in carpal and cubital tunnel syndromes. So based on this, we have a clinical triad. The clinical triad is the muscle testing protocol to delineate which level of nerve entrapment you have. Is it in the shoulder, the elbow, the wrist, or the hand? Once you've delineated the level, you want to verify the level by using the scratch collapse test. And finally, the third step is using pain upon compression and or a Tinel's test. So let's start by looking at the muscle testing protocol. The muscle testing that we use has four different positions. We use look at the shoulder, we'll look at the elbow, we'll look at the wrist, and we'll look at the hand. 
looking at the shoulder, we start by examining the strength in the pectoral and the posterior deltoid muscles. Moving down to the elbow, we'll look at the infraspinatus and external shoulder rotation. We move on to the biceps and the triceps. Done with the elbow, we move to the wrist. We'll look at wrist extension. We'll look at wrist ulnar deviation, complete ulnar deviation, and we'll look at wrist flexion. We move down to the hand. We start by looking at the hand extrinsics, the FPL and the FTP5, and we'll look at the hand intrinsics, the APB and the ADM. This is a sped up version of the manual muscle testing protocol. I will do it live in a little bit so you can see it further. So what we do is simply this, and this, like I said, I do several times a day. Patient seated, arms straight, testing the strength in the pectoral, out to the side, testing the posterior deltoid, down to the elbow, external rotation, biceps and triceps. Moving down to the wrist, looking at wrist ulnar deviation. Moving down to wrist extension, around wrist flexion. With the wrist slightly flexed, you look at FPL, FTP2, and FTP5. Finally, the hand intrinsics, the APB, and the ADM. So the key to doing the manual muscle testing is to always do bilateral testing to compare strength. Of course, you may have patients that have bilateral problems, more common than not, though, is that they have one side that is worse off than the other one. Remember to always be consistent in the testing. So even if you have a carpal tunnel syndrome, always start by testing the pectorals and the deltoids, et cetera, et cetera. Isolate the muscle that you want to examine and remember to work the patient because if you're just pushing a little lightly like that, the patient is not gonna respond. You're gonna have to be quite strong and expect the nerve conduction studies to be negative. Moving from the muscle testing, once we've delineated, for instance, that it's not a carpal tunnel, it's a Lacerda syndrome, we move on to do the scratch collapse test. The scratch collapse test was first described by Susan and McKinnon and co-workers in 2008. It involves doing a physical irritant around the suspected area of injury or nerve compression and if it's positive, the result will be a loss of voluntary muscle contraction. The theory behind the cutaneous silent period is that the is, is something called the cutaneous silent period. It means that you have a period of inhibition and tonic voluntary muscle activity due to a painful stimulus. This is actually something that you can see on EMG, for instance, in patients with carpal tunnel syndrome. This is thought to be mediated by a delta nerve fibers and is thought to be a protective inhibitory spinal reflex. The theory behind the cutaneous silent period is something called substance P. Substance P exists throughout the body, including the spinal cord and peripheral nerves. It is found, for instance, in carpal tunnel syndrome, that if you have a carpal tunnel, you will have increased levels of SP. It means that if you have a noxious stimulus, it'll boost a release of SP in the tissue. What's even more interesting is that just last year, August 2019, scientists at my alma mater in Karolinska in Stockholm found that there is actually a new cutaneous receptor. This is a cutaneous sensory neuron that consists of a beautiful dermal epidermal mesh of specialized Schwann cells. The Schwann cells uh, convey noxious, thermal, mechanical stimulus, and this transmits nociceptive information from the skin to the nerve, providing the information to that skin. This is what it looks like doing the scratch collapse test. Patient needed robustly, arms in line with the body, shoulders completely adducted, elbows 90 degrees of flexion, forearm in neutral, and do bilateral testing. So this guy that you see right here, true Swedish Viking tattoos, quite strong. Well, he's sitting there and he's got bilateral carpal tunnel syndromes because he's a carpenter. And so what I'm doing is I'm pushing as hard as I can. I scratch over the carpal tunnel and boom, the arm goes in. 
This, these slides are courtesy of Lorna Kahn, a physiotherapist in the US, and she's done tremendous work on the scratch collapse test together with Susan McKinnon and Amy Moore. So if, when you're performing the scratch collapse test, you can, for instance, actually do a scratch over the carpal tunnel. If you have a patient that has neuropathic pain, for instance, neuropathic pain from the sensory radial branch, it is too painful to scratch the skin, you can actually just fan or blow air over the area of neuropathic pain and you will get a scratch collapse test. Finally, if you have a nerve that is deeply located, for instance, I see patients with axillary nerve compressions, it's hard to scratch. So you push over the nerve and then you do the scratch test. So instead of just calling it a scratch collapse test, I think maybe we should call it a sensory collapse test because it's some sort of sensory stimulus, either to a compressed or a lacerated or a painful nerve. So the scratch collapse test is not ideal if you have a brachial plexus injury, if you have a patient with a severe rotator cuff injury or a frozen shoulder, or if you have a patient with dementia or cognitive disorders, because you need a patient that is collaborating with you. So for the clinical triad of diagnosis, we use muscle testing, as I showed you with the protocol. We use the scratch collapse test. And finally, once we've confirmed with the scratch collapse test where our level of nerve compression is, you push on the nerve or you do a Tunnell's test. As you all know, the Tunnell's test is excellent for carpal tunnel, cubital tunnel, but not very good if you have a radial tunnel syndrome, for instance. So I thought I would actually find someone that I could do the muscle testing protocol on, and then I'll give you a few examples. Toma, am I doing okay on time? Yes, perfect. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Excellent. So I'm going to walk out and I'm going to find someone who can help me with some muscle testing. And it's a little messy here because I moved to a new apartment just five days ago. So we have ladders and we yeah, have boxes of paint. So I have my... Can, can you stop sharing your screen, Elizabeth? Oh, do I have to stop sharing your screen? Hang on, let's see. Yes, perfect. Got it? Uh, okay, we, can so. see you. we can see you. At... You can see me? No? Yes, there no, we go. it's perfect. Perfect. Okay. Did you so find someone? I, I found someone. Hang on. Okay, let's see. Come here. Say hi to Sophia. <laughs> this is my daughter. Thank you, Sophia, to be here. And so Sophia is almost 13 and she is uh, going to be our my little test subject. Okay, so Sophia, could I please ask you, and I'm going to check everything and that it's working with the camera please have a seat everything okay right there perfect perfect okay so what i do with every single one of my patients that comes to the clinic put your arms straight make a fist keep your arms straight like that and so we start by testing the pectorals and so resist as I push out and resist, 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 resist as hard as you can. Yeah, you're so strong, super. And put your arms out to the side. So we're testing the posterior deltoid. And can you see this? Perfect. And resist, resist as I push in, resist, resist, resist. Okay, good job. Put your arms to the side, slightly out to the side. So we're testing external rotation in the shoulder, the infraspinatus, and resist as I push in. Oh, good job. Okay, keep your arms straight like that. So we're gonna test your biceps. She's a rock climber, so I know it's gonna work. And resist as I push down and resist, resist. Oh, good job. Okay, I'm gonna come behind. Come from behind because that's here when you're testing the triceps. So push down on my hands and push, 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 push. Super strong. Okay, we're done with the elbow. We move down to the wrist. Okay, keep your hands straight. With the elbow fully straightened, the wrists in full ulnar deviation, you place your hand. Can you see that? I'm going to move a little closer. One hand on the ulnar border of the hand, 
the other one on the radius and push, 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 push. Good job. And then you repeat on the other side. Lean forward, rest your forearms on your legs and extend your wrists and resist as I push down and resist. Excellent. Turn around, flex your fingers, flex your wrists and resist as I push down. Good job. Now come closer because when you be closer to the camera, because when you move down to the hand, what you start by doing is slight flexion of the wrist. Because when you slightly flex the wrist, you avoid a tenodesis effect in the thumb and the index finger. So flex your thumb and resist as I push up. And resist, resist, resist. I'm gonna do it on the side like that and resist. Okay. Flex your fingers all the way in. And then we'll do that and resist with the index finger. Good job. And resist with your little finger. Perfect. And then finally, the intrinsics. Thumb up, resist as I push down. And put your little finger out and resist as I push it. Et c'est voilà. Et merci beaucoup, Sophia. <laughs> Merci, Sophia. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, so, back, back, so I'm gonna, gonna go back to my other room and do I have a few more minutes to more? Yes, of course. Very interesting. I'll give you, I'll give you um, a few examples. So I'll share my screen. Let's see. For the biceps okay. and the triceps, is it important to be in supination or pronation for the wrist? Uh, I keep it in a neutral. Okay. Just so, and fist closed, neutral in the wrist, and 90 degrees of flexion. Okay. And then for the triceps, slightly more flexed, so someone really has to activate and push down. So, neutral position in the forearm. Okay, thank you. Okay. So let's look at a few examples of what you might be able to find using the muscle testing protocol. If you start by testing the pectorals, the pectoral muscles have innovation from every single one of the nerve roots from C4 all the way to TH1. So if you have a patient who is weak in the pectoral muscles, you either have a patient that has a very, very severe neck problem, or you have a patient who is not cooperative, someone who does not want to participate in the muscle test. And if your patient is not participating, then forget the entire rest of the exam. It's not going to work. You need to have a patient that is willing to cooperate. When you're moving out to the posterior deltoid and you're testing the posterior deltoid, if that is weak and everything else is strong, then this can be a localized nerve compression of the axillary nerve as it comes out of the quadrangular space at the back of your shoulder. Moving down to the triceps, if you have triceps weakness, this of course can be a C7 root problem, but if it's isolated triceps, nothing else is weak, it may be a proximal radial nerve entrapment at the level of the triangular interval. You will actually quite often find that if a patient has an axillary nerve compression, they quite often have a proximal radial nerve compression at the same time. This is seen, for instance, in spinal cord injured patients who do a lot of wheelchair uh, mobilization. If you move down to wrist extension, if wrist extension is weak, but the triceps is strong, then you have a radial nerve compression in the distal level of the upper arm at the level of the lateral inter interval, uh, about nine centimeters proximal to the lateral epicondyle, as the radial nerve swings from posterior to anterior in the upper arm. If you have a weakness isolated in the ECU, this is a radial tunnel syndrome, most often confused as a lateral epicondylitis or a tennis elbow. The radial tunnel syndrome will have a weakness in the ECU, a positive scratch collapse test over the arcade of froze and pain as you push down at the arcade. If you have a weakness in the FPL, 
combined with the FTP2 and the FCR, you have a Lacerda syndrome. And this is something I believe Jean-Paul will be talking about in a little bit. Weakness in the FTP5 is found in a cubital tunnel syndrome. The APB will be weak if you have a carpal tunnel syndrome. Of course, then you will also have a positive Tynalt test, positive scratch test, you may have a positive Salence test, etc. And finally, the ADM is weak if you have a compression of the ulnar nerve at Guillaume's canal. So if you don't remember anything out of everything that I've said about muscle testing in the upper extremity, just remember these four tests the FPL, the FTP5, median and ulnar at the elbow, the APB, and the ADM, median and ulnar at the wrist. So in conclusion, the clinical triad that we use of nerve entrapments is muscle testing, scratch collapse test, and pain and or tunnels test at the level of nerve compression. Here are a few of the references that I refer to today, if you want to do a screenshot of that. And you've already seen Sophia. This is my most lovely image of her. <laughs> Stockholm, July last year. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Tack, tack to Sophia. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, we have time if you want for one or two questions. If in the chat box you can, you can ask uh, some uh, some questions. And uh, Jean Paul, are you ready? You can uh, put your sound on. It was excellent. Thank you very much. It was very clear as usual. Hello, it was Thank wonderful. You. Can you guys hear me? Yes, great. It was amazing, Dr. Haggard. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank and you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be following, try to follow in your steps. And I'm going to share my screen in a second. Okay. Share. Okay. And then, oops. I'm oh, sorry. I'll stop sharing for a sec. And then I'm going to go back here. And then here. Oh, no. Does it work, Jean-Paul? Yes. I hope so. Oops. There is now 1,000 people, Jean-Paul. You are ready? I am born with. Okay, can you can you guys see? Yes, perfect. Wonderful. So first of all, um, thank you for all being here. Um, it is uh, 1.30 here in Montreal. I don't know what time it is for you, but um, I'm going to wish you a happy hour. You know, everybody, if, every, whatever you are. So I'm going to talk about um, carpal tunnel surgery and actually this conversation is going to be about what happens when the surgery goes bad. Um, anywhere between two and 20% of patients can end up having residual symptoms uh, after the surgery or have their symptoms come back. And this can be due to um, a faulty diagnosis. It can also be due to a poorly executed surgery, or it can be caused by a compromised nerve, or it can be sheer bad luck. So when you're dealing with a patient who has symptoms after a primary uh, carpal tunnel surgery, it's important to look at what exactly it is that you're facing um, and ask the following questions. Did the symptoms actually disappear and then recur? Did the symptoms get worse? Are we dealing with new symptoms? Or was there never any improvement? So it's really important to understand because you really want to know if you're dealing with an actual recurrence or if you're dealing with something new. So what's, what could cause a bad diagnosis? A bad diagnosis could be caused by something you missed locally, and it can be, uh, for example, a mass inside the carpal tunnel, it could be a mass that's associated with the nerve or, or not, 
or more importantly, and more often, it can be uh, caused by another entrapment of the same nerve, but anywhere else um, above the carpal tunnel. Among those, there's many, many different anatomical areas where the median nerve can become pinched. I want to point out your attention to Lacertus, uh, one of my personal favorite, because it is so common, and we'll talk about it very soon. Uh, what can also happen is that you have an entrapment of the median nerve itself in the carpal tunnel, and you can also have a, comp a compression of one of its branches higher. For example, you could have a combination of carpal tunnel syndrome with an anterior interosseous nerve syndrome. After the release of the median nerve at the wrist, then you would have an improvement of the sensory symptoms, but not of the motor symptoms. So if you face anything like that, you've got to think about this. Double entrapment can also mean that the nerve or the root is pinched in the neck. So as Dr. Haggard alluded to, you always have to think of the neck also and not just focus on the hand or the wrist. And then of course you have to think of associated pathology like uh, diseased nerves. A double crush is basically a double entrapment of the nerve. Think of it as the, the hose in your garden. When it's kinked, very rarely is it kinked in only one location. So it's gonna be very critical that you look for those entrapment, for associated entrapments. And there are um, a multitude of potential mechanisms explaining why when a nerve is pinched in one location, it becomes more susceptible to an entrapment somewhere else. And the point of this talk is not really to look at which of those is the right one. I think it has to do with disruption of the axonal transport. But just to bring your attention to the fact that double entrapment is actually very common. So we said uh, surgery could be poorly executed and result in um, undesirable outcomes. Well, surprisingly enough, and as simple and as straightforward as the surgery is, in 60% of cases requiring revision, it was found that the release of the transverse carpal ligament wasn't complete. And this is seen after endoscopic carpal tunnel release, but it's also equally frequently seen after open surgery. And then in that case, what happens is, symptoms get, um, they persist obviously, or they can even get worse. And the reason they get worse is because if then the compression of the nerve is more focal than when the whole transverse carpal ligament was putting pressure on the nerve. So now it's basically almost only the distal end of the carpal tunnel, uh, of the carpal of the ligament that's pinching the nerve. So you have more pressure there and the symptoms are actually worse after surgery than before, which is not something that anybody likes. Then obviously symptoms can clear and recur after a few months. And what you really want to pay attention to is the, time, uh, the timeline. If this happens in the following weeks or early months after surgery, what the alarm bell that should go off in your head is adhesions or, or, or scarring that, could, um, that could, could be causing restriction of gliding or tethering of the nerve or even compression. And then of course, you don't want to think about that, but you really should. If you have new symptoms after surgery, uh, it is possible that the nerve, the nerve or one of its branches was injured during the procedure. As uh, Elizabeth has described, there's a, a continuum when you consider uh, the injury that happens to the nerve. It starts with the disruption of the blood supply and goes all the way down to the death of the, the axon. And of course, that's irreversible. So when we're talking about reversible versus irreversible, you have also to keep in mind that the potential for the nerve to recover depends on many different factors, including comorbidities um, like diabetes, hyperthyroidism, uh, neuropathy, age. We know that older patients don't uh, fare as well as younger patients, and obviously the duration of the symptoms and the severity of the compression as well. Of course, you can also be dealing with bad luck. What does that mean? A complication after surgery, a complication is always bad luck, but what I'm trying to say is that sometimes the surgeon causes a complication indirectly, not willingly, obviously, but you can end up with pillar pains, for example, quite commonly, and up to 30% of cases can have pillar pains. It's most frequent after open carpal tunnel surgery than endoscopic release. And the same is true with scar sensitivity, and scar sensitivity is often an issue after open carpal tunnel surgery, and it can go on for months and months and months. Um, and for example, this patient that you can see on the screen here had um, this open surgery done by, by someone else. And this person came to see me because they needed the other side done and they didn't want to feel the same pain that they're doing now. And this is maybe a, 
two or three months out of, uh, out of the first procedure. Then obviously infection and, and CRPS are also possibility, but uh, possibilities, but they're quite rare. So what do you do now? You, you really, you have a patient who's telling you a story, so you really have to listen to the story. And you have to really listen for clues that are gonna tell you what the problem is. So you, again, you want to know what was the response to surgery? Did symptoms change? Are we dealing with new symptoms? Did the symptoms disappear and come back? Or did the symptoms fail to disappear? Were there any changes in the daily uh, activities of the patients? Have they been using their hands differently? Uh, is there a new onset of neck pain, for example? Or don't forget that you may have missed a comorbidity or maybe a new one have appeared since then. So if symptoms um, disappeared and then returned, that means the diagnosis and the surgery was, uh, were adequate. So in, in that case, think um, adhesions, scarring, reconstitution of the transverse carpal ligament, or maybe of the development of secondary conditions. Scarring, adhesions, um, can appear uh, quite frequently after any type of surgery, quite frankly, but in, they were found to be present in 88% of patients undergoing revision surgery. And adhesions and excessive scarring is probably associated with an, in, with an enhanced, exaggerated healing response with uh, lots of deposit of collagen, lots of inflammation, which causes fibrosis around the nerve, resulting in compression or tethering. It, usually, you will see symptoms come back early, meaning in the first few weeks or a couple of two or three months uh, following the surgery, because that's when the uh, inflammation and collagen deposit are, are most important. In those cases, a cortisone injection can be very helpful to calm the fire. Reconstitution of the transverse carpal ligament. Any, any hand surgeon who has done revision surgeries many years after the first surgery has probably seen this. Sometimes the uh, transverse carpal ligament looks like it was never touched. However, we know because patients tell you that they, when they had the surgery 10 years before, the symptoms disappear. So you know the surgery was properly done, but it really looks like nothing was done. So the transverse carpal ligament does reconstitute and sometimes it looks just like it never was injured. Um, I don't exactly know what the mechanism behind it is, and maybe it reconstitutes, but it's a little, maybe it shrinks, maybe it's not as long as it, you would want it to be, but it causes some narrowing of the carpal tunnel, so it will need to be divided again. And then you can have a secondary condition like inflammation that appears around the tendons, for example, uh, like in a case of rheumatoid arthritis, for example, or another type of inflammation-based uh, uh, condition causing the tendons to swell inside the canal. You can always um, deal with a patient who's had a wound infection or a hematoma causing compression. Then new symptoms. Um, when there are new symptoms, it's not good news because usually that is pretty much the hallmark of a nerve injury. It, it's an iatrogenic com complication, which means it's been caused either by your surgery or by uh, the block placement by, anesthesiology, by, by anesthesia. So if you are dealing with an anesthesiologist, you can blame him. But if you're not, and you're doing your anesthesia yourself, then obviously you might be the one to blame. Maybe you injured a nerve with your needle. In any case, what happens is patients will tell you that the pain is really usually very intense and relentless, and it appears immediately after surgery, which means patients know something went wrong during the surgery, and usually they tell you very quickly. So this means there was an injury, or there may have been an injury to the median nerve itself, or one of its branches, like the palmar cutaneous branch, or the motor branch, or in the case of an endoscopic release, an injury to the uh, common digital nerve to the third web space. In some cases, it might be a vascular injury resulting in bleeding and secondary compression of the nerve. So once you've uh, listened to your patient carefully, now you really have to examine them. And very much like Dr. Hager just described, you really have to do a thorough, complete evaluation of the entire upper extremity, including the neck. You're gonna use all the signs that you know and the tests that you know already. And you're gonna use, well, I would advise you to use a scratch collapse test or the sensory collapse test as it was just uh, recoined. 
I personally like to use the cold spray test also in addition to the cold scratch collapse test because it, it, it helps confirm it even, even further and it really helps convince patients that this is where the new problem is. Sometimes people say and think, oh, my carpal tunnel syndrome came back and, and, then, the, the, and, and then the reality of the matter is it, it's a median nerve that's entrapped higher up but because the symptoms appeared about the same, the patient doesn't know that. And of course, they assume it's the carpal tunnel that's, that's recurring. So if you can use those tests to show uh, the patient that the problem may be somewhere else. Then you have to look at the motor and the sensory function of the median nerve. You should always pay attention to where the scar is because a radially placed scar might be suggestive of, of an injury to the motor branch or to the palmar cutaneous branch, for example. Also, always think brachial plexus, think cervical spine, examine properly. I personally like to use a scratch collapse test in the neck as well. Sometimes it's positive, and, and then it, make, it will make the patient realize that there's an issue in the, in, the, uh, in the neck as well. Now comes the time to investigate further. And of course, the first test that comes to mind when you're talking about nerve entrapments is an EMG or a nerve conduction study. And, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna weigh in uh, even more on what uh, Dr. Haggard said. First of all, the nerve conduction study, uh, like a, uh, a nerve conduction study, is, is not necessarily indicated absolutely uh, for a primary carpal tunnel syndrome that you know is a carpal tunnel syndrome. So that's something that's typical. I don't think you need it, and I don't prescribe it. However, when you're dealing with a secondary case, it's interesting if you have one before the first surgery to compare it to the one you have, you're gonna order now, because then you can see whether the nerve function has improved or worsened or stayed the same. So if the nerve, if the electrical function of the nerve has improved, even if the patient still has some symptoms, I think it's pretty safe to monitor the patient uh, for a little longer because that means the nerve is just getting better. And the patient may not be aware of it or the symptoms may be lagging a little bit. So you could wait a little bit. However, if the, if the nerve conduction study is worse, then you should probably explore the nerve and go back surgically. Something else that's really important to know is that nerve conduction studies rarely go back to normal, even up to two years after or later. And that's very important to know because patients who had a primary carpal tunnel release done somewhere else, they come to you and then you examine them. And of course, they come uh, with, with a second uh, EMG and they tell you, um, you know, look, my, my, my carpal tunnel syndrome is, 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 is still bad. My EMG shows that it's bad. You need to know that in many, many cases, the electrical studies do not go back to normal. So it doesn't mean that's where the problem is. And it doesn't rule out a secondary entrapment somewhere else. So keep in mind. In addition to this, uh, there often are communications between the median uh, and the ulnar nerve in the forearm or in the hand or even in the fingers that can cause and result in false uh, positives. So um, something to keep in mind. Personally, I like ultrasound. It allows you to scan the nerve and look for uh, nerve swelling. You could look for a notch sign. You could look for blurring uh, of the honeycomb pattern, meaning you can't see the fascicles in the nerve. And that can be a sign of entrapment. And you can look for nerve gliding. An MRI of the neck can be useful if you have any reason to think there might be something up there. Blood work can be indicated if you have any reason to think there might be a diabetes underlying or a thyroid disease or a deficiency in, in B vitamins. I always give my patients uh, B complex uh, supplements, uh, magnesium and coenzyme Q10 and all my um, peripheral nerve uh, patients uh, just to make sure they have what they need to heal before, during and after procedure. I would advise to review surgical records if they're available and in particular, if you are not the operating surgeon. But more importantly, if you uh, have access to the hand therapist who's been following the patient, they spend a lot more time with the patients than you do or than I do. Therefore, I think a conversation with them is very useful because they, they're pretty good at telling you what happened. Cortisone injections in this type of situation is not as good as um, when it's used for primary carpal tunnel syndrome, meaning that if you're not sure about the diagnosis, uh, cortisone shot has a good predictive uh, value for primary CTS, not so much in secondary. In other words, 
you can use it, but uh, the the response and the interpretation of it is to be is to be taken with a grain of salt. Non-surgical management, well, you know, scar treatment, massage, silicone, splinting, nerve lining. I think it's appropriate for a few months if you do not believe that there's a nerve, um, that there's a potential nerve injury. Now, if the symptoms persist or get worse, then surgery will be indicated again. I, and you can do this endoscopically or open. Personally, I do my revisions uh, endoscopically. Uh, whether the primary case was done uh, endoscopic or open, but only if the soft tissues are, are of good quality, and also only if I can see uh, the transverse carpal ligament really well. If there's any doubt, if it's, if it's difficult to get on there, under there, then I will convert to open. And you can, straight, you can go straight to open if you'd like. You can even extend the incision proximally to uh, make sure the transverse carpal ligament was, in, was incised completely. You can look for and release any adhesions. You can look for the motor branch. And of course, if there's a, an injury to the nerve, then you can proceed with a, with a repair. You can then, if, if there's a lot of adhesions, you can then decide to interpose tissues based on a, a facial flap coming from the irradial artery or ulnar artery or a hypothenar fat pad flap. You can even wrap a vein around the nerve to protect it from um, scarring, or you can use a matrix made of collagen to uh, protect the nerve from, the, uh, from, from being uh, scarred in again. Then if you have complete loss of thinner muscle, then you should really, believe, you should really think of restoring the abduction and opposition of the, of the thumb with a tendon transfer, which can be performed un, under Wallant elegantly. Now I wanna say a few words about what I think is the most, one of the most underdiagnosed and undermanaged uh, entrapment syndromes of the, median, uh, of the upper extremity, which is Lacerda syndrome. Lacertus is a compression of the median nerve in the forearm, right here in the elbow area, and it frequently coexists with carpal tunnel syndrome. I've reviewed my own numbers, um, and out of uh, a sample of uh, 50 uh, patients who came to see me with um, uh, symptoms of carpal tunnel syndrome, 80% of them had also a Lacertus syndrome. So when I say it's common, it's extremely common. So who does that affect? Does it affect people who uh, work with the forms and pronation, so computer workers a lot, and more than manual laborers. Here's a reminder of the anatomy. You can see the median nerve in yellow running underneath the pronator teres, uh, the, the humeral head of the pronator there. And then it, you can see it runs under this uh, white structure coming off the uh, biceps tendon, that's Lacerda's fibrosis. And that Lacerda's can cause some sort of a minimal um, uh, compartment syndrome by squish, squishing uh, the, the, the median nerve just enough that the axonal transport is uh, compromised and which is going to cause problems. And speaking of problems, I think it's very important to look for the magic. I love magic, so you have to look for it. And what is the magic? It's the words that people will say when they have Lacerda's. And if you don't pay attention, you will focus on the carpal tunnel and you will completely ignore um, uh, Lacerda's. But Lacerda's has a language on its own. And people complain of weakness uh, of the hands and of key pinch. They uh, complain of being clumsy. They drop things. Um, they do complain of pins and needles, but not so much and not as much as carpal and carpal tunnel syndrome. But more importantly, these pins and needles appear during the day during their activities and they don't wake people up at night or early in the morning, they don't have to flick their wrist as much. Flicking is caused by carpal tunnel syndrome. And then you should ask if they're not telling you, um, do you feel any discomfort in the forearm and in particularly in the elbow? And often people will tell you, yes, there's, there's, some pro there's, there's something going on here. And they'll tell you it radiates pro uh, proximally and all the way up to the shoulder. So if they don't say it, ask them. And, and you'll be surprised what you're going to discover. This is the mecha mechanism here. You can see the, the nerve being squeezed between the, brachial, um, the brachialis and the lacertus. Um, and Dr. Haggard has described this. So what you really want to look at, because this is what the compression will cause, is weakness in specific muscles, the flexor pollicis longus, the flexor carpi radialis, and the FDP2. 
So you really want to test for the power. If you don't test for the power, you'll miss it because the reduction in power is about 30%, maybe a little more, but you will miss it guaranteed if you don't specifically look for it. You got to go for the clues. You have to be uh, Sherlock Holmes here. You have to look beyond the obvious. And then you have to palpate the median nerve. It's going to be painful under the Lacertus. You've got to press it down and you're going to see your patient flinch. And then you have to use the scratch collapse test, or you should. And I like to use the cold spray. So this is a surgery I, was, I was performed under Wallant. Two centimeter incision in the, in the, in the uh, medial side of the uh, elbow crease. And this is me testing the XFCR prior to releasing the nerve. So see, the patient is trying to resist me. There's no power. And now we're, I'm asking the patient to resist and try to, to flex the index finger and resist me. They can't. There's no power. And now uh, we're going to perform the surgery together. And so the incision was just carried down to the, 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 the subcutaneous tissue. It's very important at this time to protect the uh, sensory cutaneous branches of the antibrachial nerve so that you don't have uh, neuroma. You can see the fascia. I'm going to incise the fascia exposed to pronator. And now I'm going to retract the pronator terrace. And I'm exposing the nerve and the fat pad that's around it. And at this point, I'm looking uh, to make sure that everything is free, that um, the, 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 the nerve is no longer constricted. And that there's no adhesions from the nerve or uh, between the nerve and the underlying brachialis. I like to use what's called the, the pinky test. I insert my pinky inside the canal all the way down to uh, the pronator um, tunnel between the two heads of the pronator. Make sure there's no com residual compression there. And the surgery is done. And now we're going to test. Immediately after, you can see the patient has power. Immediately. And Patients are usually quite astonished when they see that, and I am astonished as well. This is the power they have in the index finger. Remember, they didn't have any, and the same goes with the thumb. So now they got power in their thumb as well, and it's immediate. It comes back immediately. It's just like you take off your foot uh, off the hose, and the power comes back. Closure is a one-layer closure. Serious strip, soft dressing, people shower the next day. So in conclusion, I'm going to say, that when you're dealing with failed carpal tunnel surgery or recurring symptoms, you should perform a comprehensive upper extremity evaluation. You should remember that nerve conduction studies do remain abnormal, so they're useful if you have pre-op ones to compare, but the, the chances are they're going to remain abnormal. You should look for an associated entrapments before you do your first surgery, so you get it right from the start. Use the scratch collapse test or the sensory collapse test. Use the cold spray. Release the double entrapment immediately. Why expose the patient to two surgeries when you can do only one? And I'd like for you to think of Lacerda's syndrome as the most common cause of residual symptoms after carpal tunnel release. And I'm going to leave you on this definition here. The definition of a minor surgery is a surgery that is performed on someone else than me. I don't believe there's small surgeries. Every, every surgery is serious. And so I'm going to leave you with that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jean-Paul. We have, you listen to me? Yes, I do. Yes, and uh, we have a few questions uh, about, your, about your topic. It was very interesting. Thank you very much. It was outstanding. So um, the first one was uh, about uh, sports medicine. Do you see a lot of lacertus fibrosis syndrome in sports and maybe in timbers or maybe uh, in uh, people practice in gym every day do you, what uh, what do you think about uh, uh, yes um, i think the more you use uh, the bigger the brachialis the more you have chances of having it squeezed and myself i train quite a bit and i have a surgery on both sides okay. uh, which was diagnosed by by toma a while ago and confirmed by elizabeth and right. elizabeth was supposed to perform my surgery uh, in may and then COVID happens, so I'm stuck at home. And because I don't have access to the, the weight as heavy as normally, well, my forearm, my forearms are not as powerful as they were, and my brachialis has shrunk a little bit. And as a result, my Lacerda's got better. Um, it's not healed, but the pain in my forearm has definitely uh, uh, decreased. So I do believe that, you know, if you have big brachialis muscles, uh, there's a chance that your nerve 
might be squished. So anything that causes your brachialis to, to, to become thicker can, can result in that. I also believe that with age, the Lacertus is, is probably getting thicker uh, and not just thicker, but um, less elastic. I think in young people, it's more flexible. So it's more like an elastic, but as you get older, it probably becomes more like a, like a string, like a rope. So it, it, it's, it becomes more restrictive. So what's the mean age of your patient with less distributed syndrome? I want to say uh, anywhere between 40 and, and 50 or 60, but I see it in, in all ages. Okay. And, and I've treated people who are 80 years old and more. Okay. Okay. So do you have uh, an idea about the difference about Lassiter's Tribulus Syndrome and Pronator Syndrome? Maybe it's, it's, Elizabeth yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. a lot of questions about that because a lot of people talk about Pronator Syndrome. Who's the question for? Yeah, uh, maybe for Elizabeth. Uh, okay. You're on mute, Elizabeth. Can you... No, no, no I'm, I'm back. I'm back. Yeah, you're back, okay. Because I have a lot of... What is it, pronatal syndrome lacidus? Well, pronator syndrome was first described by uh, Safar in 1954. And so it simply means that the median nerve compression that we've always known about in the elbow has been the pronator syndrome. But in the past 10 years, I've done 500 or more Lacertus releases in Lacertus syndrome. And out of all of those patients, only four have had an actual pronator syndrome where it was the pronated teres muscles causing the compression of the nerve and not the lacertus fibrosis. So I believe that the pronator syndrome is a misnomer. Forget about the pronator syndrome. Think that it is a lacertus syndrome unless something else is found during surgery. Okay. And we have a question about the conservative treatment in lacertus uh, syndrome. Do you perform in cortisone injection or maybe? Yeah, so I will, I will usually start with a cortisone injection right underneath the edge of the Lacertus fibrosis and uh, look at the ergonomics of the workspace so they're not working too much with their arms pronated and doing nerve gliding exercises for the median nerve uh, and shoulder posturing because uh, scapular dyskinesia can also cause problems around the median nerve and the elbow. So important to remember your shoulder position. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Paul. Uh, we can come back to the questions after that. After my topic about ultrasound, I will be uh, very quick, don't worry. So I will share my screen. And uh, I will talk to you about ultrasound of the uh, nerve at the uh, upper limb. So finally, this is a sense of uh, history and this is a picture of Echo and Narcisse. Um, with Narcisse is uh, looking at his uh, own face. Uh, 60 million years ago, it was the Sitchins, it was mammals uh, going back to the, uh, to the water. And uh, after that, at the beginning of the uh, uh, 20th, 20th century, the submarines. The radiologists thought about uh, see uh, blood in the brain, but unfortunately, the ultrasound cannot go through the bone. So, uh, uh, in the 15s, it was a, a failure. But after that, the gynecologist in the 70s, uh, the cardiologist, natives, urologists, rheumatologists, and finally, orthopedics and plastic surgeons in the uh, beginning of the 21 surgery. So you have to perform that because it's painless, it's comparative, there is no side effect, it's dynamic, it's cheap, reachable, and uh, more precise and more, rich and more reachable than uh, MRI finally. And it's educational uh, to your patient and to your colleagues. So this is very interesting to perform it in your office with uh, this small machine or you can uh, have a very interesting to uh, perform ultrasound. For your ultrasound for diagnosis is of course for radiologists, but uh, you can do it in a patient clinic for studying, for compare, following and explaining to the patient. 
uh, you can have an ultrasonography in the technical care room to inject, to make biopsy, or cut or excise uh, some part of the body. And you can have uh, ultrasound in the operating room, and this is the ultrasound of surgery. Thomas? So, yes? Can you slide show your presentation? Thank you can you. Full screen. You can, can, you see, can you see that my... Uh, you see the ultrasound? You could diaporama, so it's full screen. No, no, because I, I want to show some videos. And oh, okay, okay, that's sorry. Ah, okay. So for the radial nerve, I will show you two uh, tricks uh, about uh, ultrasonography. So this is important to have a good position of the patient, like that for the radial nerve at the arm. And uh, you can see here uh, uh, the... Uh, uh, view of the radial nerve and there is a humeral bone here and you can follow it proximally and distally very very easily this is distally okay and I can show you a video of this so there is an artery here and this is the radial nerve at the arm you go distally here this is the radiomeral bone, and after that, coming back to proximal. So this is quite uh, easy because there is a, a lot of muscle around the nerve. The muscle is black, okay, it's hypocaic, uh, uh, and uh, there is a, a lot of uh, uh, differences with the nerve. So for the radial nerve at the forearm, you can uh, follow the radial nerve after that and coming uh, into, the, uh, into the forearm around the uh, supinator muscle. So this is, there is a, also an artery here. And, oh, excuse me, this is for the, uh, this is for the uh, radial nerve at the arm. The radial nerve at the forearm is here. Okay, and this is the uh, radial bone. This is the supinator. And this is the uh, radial nerve here between the muscle. You have to look for uh, the space between the muscle and you can uh, follow the radial nerve just before uh, the uh, uh, small nerves uh, in the... Uh, ECTR and uh, uh, other muscle for the extension of the wrist. For the ulnar nerve at the elbow, you have to do the arm like that. It's uh, very convenient to put. Thomas, Thomas, est-ce que tu peux enlever ta vidéo? Uh, le son est mauvais. Enlever ma vidéo. Toi, toi, vite ta vidéo. Je te l'enlève. Arrêtez la vidéo. Like that? Ouais, voilà. Voilà. Vas-y, parle. This is the position. OK. It's OK for you? Oui, c'est meilleur, là, comme ça. This is the position of the forearm of the person. You have to be vertical. And it's not like uh, in the operating room. You have to uh, um, take care of the ulnar nerve here. It's on the same side of the thumb, like this. And you put a lot of gel. And you can do like that, proximally and distally. And you can make an extension and the flexion of the elbow to see the stability of the nerve. This is very important not to press too much on the probe because if not, you will stabilize the nerve with the probe. So this is very important to put a lot of gel and to uh, be very gentle with your, with your probe. So this is the... Uh, video here. This is the ulnar nerve and this is the uh, epicondyle, medial epicondyle here and this is the ulnar nerve in distally into the uh, flexor inalis uh, muscle. So you can test it. You can test it in flexion and in extension like that and you have to check if the nerve is behind the uh, bone in flexion and in extension. So you can perform it like that.
this is the ulnar nerve and you can uh, measure the uh, cross section and it must be less than uh, eight or nine millimeters square. So for the ulnar nerve at the wrist, you have to put the wrist in a slight extension like that and to put your probe perpendicularly to, uh, to the nerve to avoid the anisotropy. And uh, uh, you can follow the uh, ulnar nerve at the Guillaume's canal here, ulnarly in the palmar side of the wrist. So you have to uh, see, it's not so easy at the beginning. You have to um, see the artery, the ulnar artery. This is the uh, carpal tunnel here. And ulnar artery, and this is the ulnar nerve here. And this is the uh, bone, the pisiformis uh, bone here. So you can, you can follow the nerve. I will show you at the Guyon's canal. So this is the artery and this is the uh, bone. So it's be between the artery and the bone. So this is a nerve here and it's not so simple, but proximally it's more simple to follow the nerve here at the, uh, at the forearm. So I will show you now the uh, famous median nerve at the uh, elbow. So you can easily uh, put your uh, arm uh, uh, in extension, the elbow in extension, and to see the biceps tendon. It's not so easy to see the biceps tendon, finally. It's, more, uh, it's easier to uh, see the uh, uh, broker artery, and after that, ulnarly, there is the uh, median nerve. So you can follow it very simply, proximally and distally. Up and this is here the uh, tendon. Here, this is the bicep tendon, distal bicep tendon. This is the artery, and this is the median nerve here. And the lastus fibrosus is just up to the uh, artery and the median nerve. So I will show you under ultrasound. This is the artery here, and this is the median nerve, brachialis, pronator teres muscle, and this is the uh, median nerve distally and proximally. Okay, and you can see it, the pronator teres and the brachialis just jump all told about that. You can put some double mode. And you can push on your probe to uh, avoid the vents, and you see only the uh, artery here and the median nerve here. So it's not so easy to see the bicep tendon, but it's very easy to see uh, the artery. And after that, you can make the test of the flexor, the flexion of the wrist to see the nerve compressing between the brachialis and the pronator. Brachialis is here, there is the median nerve here, and there is the uh, pronator teres. So when you um, make a, a full uh, flexion of your wrist against uh, resistance, you can see here the nerve sometimes uh, pressed by the, uh, between the two muscles. For the median nerve as the wrist, you can put the wrist in the slight extension, but you have to be aware of the uh, anisotropy uh, and uh, you have to follow the nerve just to be perpendicular uh, distally to the nerve in the carpal tunnel. So this is the nerve here. The cross section must be uh, under 14 millimeters square and uh, here in the uh, carpal tunnel, you can see here the uh, flexor carpi radialis tendon. This is the scaphoid. 
This is the PC formis here. And this is the nine flex of tendons and the median nerve here under the uh, uh, ligament. At the wrist, it's quite simple. And uh, you have to follow the nerve here. This is into the forearm between the uh, muscles and you go distally and suddenly it disappears. So you have to uh, incline your probe and to see it in, in order to see it in the uh, carpal tunnel. You can see it longitudinally. You have to turn your probe perpendicularly. So this is the nerve here and like a showing gun, you can put your probe longitudinally to the nerve and to follow here the nerve under the ligament here. So this is the flexion tendon, there is a nerve and there is a ligament. And you can move, of course, the, uh, you can move, of course, the uh, fingers and you can see the glide of the, uh, of the nerve and of the tendon. So thank you very much. I will come back to you. So maybe Jean-Paul, you can hear me? But I think you have to switch on your... Yes, thank you, thank you. And uh, I see you answer a lot of questions about the machine. Uh, I have to notice that Jean-Paul and Elisabeth uh, have a huge experience of, uh, of ultrasonography. So thank you again, guys. Do you have uh, other questions uh, to Jean-Paul or to Elisabeth or for myself? Thomas, turn on your video, but we can't see you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. There was a... There was a question about uh, adjuvant procedures. Jean-Paul, I don't know if you answer that, but about what do you think about uh, muscular flaps or epineurotomy uh, uh, when you see a patient already operated with that kind of adjuvant procedures? What was the question? Uh, if you see a patient with, uh, uh, who, who have been already operated with adjuvant procedure, you know, maybe hypotenar flaps, or uh, you mean somebody who already had a revision and comes to me with that? I'm very lucky they don't come to me. Okay, so you, <laughs> you cannot answer that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can tell you that the results of revision carpal tunnel surgery is obviously not as good as a primary. Yeah. So it's, which is why it's so important to do it right in the first, uh, first time around. Yes. And, and obviously a third procedure is, is, is not, is not going to be a, a, as good in, in, in producing a good outcome. So I don't, I don't think I've ever had somebody who had uh, already had a flap or anything like that come for later surgery. And I, I don't think I would do it. I think, I mean, I would definitely look for another entrapment, as I said before. Okay. Because um, if plan A failed, plan B, I don't think should be repeating plan A. So there should be, there's probably another reason. And uh, one thing I did not mention is smoking. Uh, smoking definitely has a major impact on nerve healing and, and on the outcome. So I would definitely advise patients to completely discontinue smoking. And uh, if it was revision surgery, I'm not, you know, I, I would strongly recommend discontinuation of smoking and I would, uh, hesitate in performing surgery in, in a smoker uh, who doesn't want to quit. I, I know you are very aware about uh, what people eat. And uh, in this time of uh, COVID, there is, uh, um, you, you are forbidden to, uh, to give uh, non-steroid uh, anti-inflammatory. So maybe you have advice about uh, what they can eat or what they can use uh, to have uh, good stuff to eat? 
for for patients yes yeah. I, I recommend antioxidants every day yes meaning a, a smoothie smoothie made of green uh vegetable yeah. i recommend celery uh lettuce kale uh anything that's green really uh with lemon juice ginger uh turmeric cayenne pepper uh without sugar uh every day and then i also recommend a bunch of supplements um to for nerve support and against inflammation so I, i'm big on that and i'm big also on uh modifying diet i i advise my patients who deal with inflammation in their hands and wrists wh whether it's arthritis or nerve entrapments whatever else uh to stay away from dairy to stay away from uh sugar as much as possible and to move away from gluten also and i find it makes a difference and the big one is alcohol and unfortunately people love their alcohol but i tell them listen if you need to have alcohol maybe you can have less per week i ask them how many how many glasses you have per week and you cut that by 50% and then uh if you can pick your alcohol better so that there's less sugar and if you do all those things a lot of symptoms associated with inflammation get better okay yeah thank you very much okay so maybe it's time to stop this uh, webinar thank you very much thank you very much uh, dr haggart and dr butus thank you all for attending it's been lovely having people from all over the world while i'm sitting in my little apartment in stockholm so so nice to see you all thank you everyone and uh, again happy hour because i don't know what time it is for you so happy hour yes and um, there is some Australian people and it's 3 a.m. for them. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Dan Under, for joining. Oh, New, Ge New Zealand is in the house. Thank you, New Zealand. Turkey, Brazil, Argentina. There is 44 countries, John Paul, please stop. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> and I believe there's even people from France, even Paris, I think. No, no, I, <laughs> I can't believe it. <laughs> no, Versailles, Versailles. Yes. Someone from Alaska as well. Alaska. Oh, fantastic. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you very much. Thank you. Stay safe, guys. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much to be here. Bye.